Hallelujah. Romans chapter number seven. Romans chapter number seven. Beginning at verse number 18. Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, hmm, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin. Hmm that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Mm. Oh, wretched man that I am. Mm. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death. Verse number 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Thank God for his word. For just a few moments, and then I'm going to pray. I want to talk from this title, The Battle of Two Natures. Hmm, come on, now say it with me. The Battle of Two Natures. Now, y'all know how we do it. You owe me at least three amens during this sermon. Anything else, I just consider credit. Um, yes, yes, the battle of two natures. The first, the first thing is, it is, um, it is clear through the scriptures as you study the Bible that every one of us in this room we have two natures. The first one, we call it the human nature. And the second one, we call the spirit nature. That is two natures living inside of us. The human nature represents your physical man. The spirit nature represents your spirit man. And of course, human nature refers to the fundamental characteristics and uh, qualities that are inherited in a human being. It is what we would call uh, flesh and bones wrapped around five senses. Yeah. The sense of sight and sound, taste, smell, and touch. And in this human physical body, 
Sight gives us the ability to see physically. Sound gives us the ability to hear. Taste, it is what it is. Smell, it is what it is. And to touch anything that is physical, anything that is tangible. These uh, five senses were not ever designed through sight to see in the spirit. Physical sight was only designed to see physical things. Uh, hearing was only designed to hear things in the physical realm, not the spirit realm. Uh, and then, of course, sound. The physical body has the ability only to hear sound in the physical, but not the spiritual. That's not what your uh, human nature was created to do. And then, of course, to touch. You can only touch things in the uh, physical, but not the spiritual. That's the human nature of mankind. But because we are two-natured, we have a human nature, and then we have the spiritual nature. And our spiritual nature, it refers to the essence or the core of a person that goes beyond the physical and material aspect of life. The spiritual refers to uh, the uh, intangibility or intangible or the immortal aspects of human existence. Also, uh, the spirit is the part of man's emotions and thoughts, creativity, and spirituality. So, human nature uh, touches and experiences the physical, while the spirit nature touches and experiences the spiritual. Uh, spiritual nature is eternal, unlike the flesh. Physical flesh is not eternal. Uh, that's, why the, that's why Paul said, if this earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have another building and house not made by hand, but eternal in heaven. But the spiritual nature or the spiritual man is eternal and transcendent and in many ways connected to the soul. And of course, from God's perspective, we are not a human having a spiritual experience, but we are a spirit having a human experience. Because we are a soul with a spirit, but we live in a body. All right. I said we, we, we are a soul. We have a spirit, but we live in a body. And what God did was is he created a house for our soul and spirit to dwell in. So that the command that he gave to Adam in Genesis to rule and to subdue and have dominion would be, a, would be able to accomplish that. God never commands us to do something without giving us the ability to accomplish it. Amen. Had he only given us a soul and spirit and gave us that command, there's no way man could have achieved it because in order to touch the physical, you got to be in the, in the physical. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And of course, one day we know that this body, this flesh, will die. But our soul and spirit will live forever. Great God today. Uh, 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 Paul, he puts it like this in one of his, his epistles, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse 53. He says it like this. He says, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. And this mortal shall put on him mortality. Great God today. 
That means we're going to go through a spiritual metamorphosis. We're going to shake off this mortal and put on immortality. Amen. And so then, the first word of caution in this message is this. Do not let your flesh man condemn your soul and spirit to eternal separation from God. Hallelujah. Because, uh, because when this body decay, when this physical man decay, it is the real you that is going to live forever. Your soul and your spirit. Two questions that uh, I think are important to understand as we're dealing with this subject. Uh, number one is, why are we human? And number two, why are we spirit? Why are we human? And why are we spirit? Why do I have a human nature? And why do I have a spirit nature? Hmm. Well, first of all, we are created human to touch the physical. We are created human to touch the physical. And we were created spiritual, watch this, to connect with and communicate with God. Because when God communicates with us, he communicates with our spirit and not our flesh. Mm. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, he says, but the natural man, the physical man, the human nature man, Receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, neither can he know them because they are spiritually designed. And then he says, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. Because God can be so deep that the physical mind cannot comprehend it. It can only be interpreted by the spirit of God, spirit to spirit, great God today. <laughs> oh, Lord, I thank you for the ability to not just know you in the physical, but to know you in the spiritual. Another question I think is important is how did God create us physical and how did God create us spiritual? There must be an answer to that. And it is. Genesis chapter number 2. Verse number 7. I'm enjoying my own preaching. <laughs> he says this is verse number 7. says. And the Lord God formed man. Here it is. Out of the dust of the ground. That sounds like physical to me. Mm. That, that's physical. Because that's dirt. Uh, he formed man out of the dust of the ground. Watch this. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living soul. And so when God breathed into man, he breathed spirit into man. And God says, because my spirit is in you. And I've given you a soul. So now you have, you, have, you, have, you have body, soul, and spirit. But the soul and spirit will connect with me spiritually. But your physical body connects with the physical realm. So we have the these, these spirit realm and we have the physical realm. The body was never created to connect with the spirit realm. But the spirit man, great God today, was created to connect with the spirit realm. So that when God begins to communicate with us, he, did, he don't get permission from your eyes. When God begins to speak to you, he doesn't get permission from your ears. Because the Bible says, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen for the things that are seen, Oh my God, they, they are temporal and the things that are not seen, they are eternal because my physical eyes and my physical ears, it see things for what they really are. But in the spirit, great God today, 
Amen. An obstacle in the spirit only looks like a transitional statement that gets me from one place to the next place in the kingdom of God. And so here, right in this one verse here, Genesis 2 and 7, we can see, amen, where God made us human nature and he made us spirit nature. Hallelujah. And, and so that brings us to, to our, 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 our topic, our subject today, is because what makes it a battle between the two natures? Paul describes it like this in our text. He says, but I see another law in my members, my members, my members, my physical body, my physical nature. He calls that in my members, my eyes, my ears, uh, my sense of smell and taste and touch, what I touch, what I see. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You do know that the eyes are the window to the soul. <laughs> he says, so I see another law in my members. Here it is, warring against the law of my mind. The word mind is translated spirit. Hallelujah. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. And so he said, that's, 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 that's where the problem is. Is that, is that my, 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 my body, my flesh wants to do one thing and my spirit man wants to do another thing. And there's a battle going on between the two. And, and, and eventually somebody's going to win. Hallelujah. He says, warring against the, amen, the law of my mind, against my spirit. No, my members, my members, my body is crying out for satisfaction. But the problem with it, in order to satisfy the flesh, I'll displease God. And the spirit of man is trying to keep me in check. Hallelujah. And so there's a war going on. Because what the flesh wants to do is bring me into captivity, my God, to the law of sin and the law of death. You see, you see, the Bible describes the root of the war between, uh, uh, between the natures as in Romans uh, uh, in our text where he says, he says, for they, uh, matter of fact, actually Romans 8 and 5, he describes like this. He says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. In the next verse he says, for to be carnally minded mm, is death. That means worldly. That means, that means allowing your body, your flesh, to lead you to do whatever it wants to do, when and how it wants to do it. Because one thing about the flesh is it never, it never considers the consequences of its actions. Amen. It only seeks for gratification. Amen. You know, you've heard people say this, I don't care, I'm going to do it and I'll deal with the consequences later. Well, that's, see, see, that's because, that's because you're numb to the consequences. But if you really knew what the consequences were, amen, you, you, may have, you may have a different dialogue. You know, stuff like, you must be crazy. See, but you don't get to that, you must be crazy, until you've yielded to some things, and it took you forever to get out of it, and you had to pray and fast, and God, if you get me out, I won't go back, and I won't do this, I won't go back, I won't do this. You, know, you, you get so deep, and, and the flesh can get you in so much trouble, until you feel like you're not going to survive, you're not going to make it. Sometimes you barely make it. I mean, by the, what, 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 what was the, what's the phrase, by the, by, by, the, by the skin of your chinny chin? And all of a sudden, God snatches you out, and you didn't think you were going to survive it. You didn't think you were going to make it. And then the flesh starts acting up again. That's when you get to that. You must be crazy. Ask your neighbor, have you got there yet? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a couple of them in my life. I do. God knows. I, do. God knows. I got a couple of them in my life that when the enemy comes back to me, I say, you must be crazy. When I could have died and when I should have died. But God's grace 
was sufficient for me. His strength was made perfect in my weakness. And now that God has, has, has rescued me. And you got the nerve to think you can come back to me with that again? You must be crazy. Hallelujah. He says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Here it is. He says, for to be carnally minded is death. Yeah. Death. For the wages of sin is death. That is your payment. Hallelujah. Amen. That's a check. Amen. You're guaranteed to get. He says, he says, but to be spiritually minded mm, is life and peace life and peace so the first decision we got to make between the battle of our two natures is understanding that yielding to your flesh will only give you a harvest of death but yielding to the spirit the bible says amen 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 you reap life and peace ain't nothing like the peace of god I'm going to write about it. Here's what he says, verse 7. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. The flesh, the mind, the flesh is enmity. The word enmity means an enemy. Great God today. And you don't want to be an enemy of God. He says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Watch this. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Not only is it not subject to the law, but it couldn't be if it wanted to. And then Paul says, he says, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Hallelujah. 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 And then Paul picks it up in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. Paul says, what he said, he says, since, uh, you know, uh, since his flesh uh, is not subject to the law of God. Uh, this is, he said, this is what I do. Uh, uh, in verse 27, he said, he said, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection that, 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 that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. <laughs> oh, I love that word. He said, subjection. He says, I keep my body under. I keep my body and bring it into subjection. In other words, he says, I, 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 my, my, my spirit man has the rule over my physical man that when he starts acting up and acting out, my spirit man checks my flesh. And I bring him into subjection. At least that by any means, when I preach to others, I myself become a castaway. Amen. This is, this is what Paul says to do in, in Romans chapter 8 verse 13. He says this. He says, for if ye uh, live after the flesh, ye shall die. That's, that's, that's blank plain. I, I, I don't care how you dress it up. You can, you can compromise with it. You can say, I don't believe it. You know, you can, you can run with the doctrine of the crowd. You can, learn, you can listen to all this new age speaking and teaching. But Paul said, great God today. For if you live after the flesh, he shall die. But then he goes on to say, but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of your body, you shall live. Now you got a choice. Do you want to die? Or do you want to live? And following the popular doctrines of the 21st century does not make it right because God is the same yesterday today and forever what he said back then he mean it today he said before one jot or one tiller of my word shall fail the heavens and the earth shall pass away great God today he kind of reminds me of one of my favorite sitcom characters Barney Fife I love Barney Fain. He's always into something. But one day he was having a conversation with somebody. And they had the nerve to say to him, what did you say? And he said, I don't chew my cabbage twice. 
And that's what God is saying. No, 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 no. Ain't no new doctrine. God don't chew his cabbage twice. He's already told us in his word. Somebody shout glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, but if you mortify, that word mortify means to put to death. Mm. That means every day you wake up, the first thing you ought to have is a eulogy. Mm. Keep your black dress somewhere near you. Brothers, keep your black suit somewhere near you. So that when you see something in your life that needs to be put to death, symbolically is what I'm saying, put your black dress on. Put your black suit on. Say, we, we's going to have a funeral today. Because there's some things in my life I got to put to death. There's some folk in my life I got to put to death. Are you hearing me here? Because the problem is, the problem is a, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And if I get gangrene in a toe, it'll move up to my foot and then my leg. But I got to cut it off. Because I choose to live and not die. You may call me holy roller. That's all right. But I'm going to live. You may call me sanctimonious. That's all right. But I'm going to live. You may think I'm better than anybody else. That's all right. But I'm going to live. I hear you Holy Ghost. But the good news is. You know there's always some good news. The good news is. Hey Amen. You can win this battle between your two natures. I said you can win the battle. And, there, and one of the reasons why you can win the battle is because you're not fighting a battle that hasn't been fought. You're fighting a battle that has already been won. Some 2,000 years ago, Jesus went to the cross of Calvary and when he said it is finished, great God today, that means he got the victory over death, hell, and degree. And then he said to his children, and I will give to you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. And so when the enemy comes in like a flood, God says, you lift up the banner against him, the blood standing banner. And remind that whatever trap he's trying to set, whatever thing he's trying to bring to you, I've already died for it. And be not entangled again mm. with the yoke of bondage. And so, if you really want to win this battle between your flesh man and your spirit man, the first thing you must do, and you can't avoid it, but you can't get around it, the first thing you must do to win the battle is you've got to feed your spirit and starve your flesh. <laughs> Did you hear what I just said? You've got to feed your spirit and starve your flesh. Well, well, listen, see, you got, so, 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 so you got, you got two, two, two natures. All right. Throughout the week, what are you feeding them? Uh, let me ask you this. Okay. What, what, what are you feeding your, 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 your flesh nature? What are you feeding your spirit nature? Say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You're feeding your flesh nature Facebook all day. Instagram all day. I'm not saying you can't eat it. I'm not saying you can't, you can't enjoy it. Hallelujah. But what are you looking at when you look what you look at when you look at? What's really getting your attention? You do, do you understand, do you understand what the algorithm of social media is? Okay. The algorithm of social media is, is that when you, when you watch something, they calculate what you're watching. And in that algorithm, let's say, let's say, let's say you're looking at somebody that's dropping it like his hut. And it gets your attention. Well, the algorithm is going to calculate that. And every time you go to your page, they're going to feed it to you. Did you hear what I said? 
Did you not know that Japan owns the algorithm of what we see on social media? That's why what our children see here, they don't see there. See, our children, what they see is kids cussing out the mom. They, they see fights in the street. And they, and they see guys picking up girls. And, and they see drugs. They, they see all of that. But over there in Japan, where they control the algorithm, they see, they see kids in, in spelling bees. They see them becoming entrepreneurs. And, and they see them becoming engineers. And, and they see them being disciplined. Because they control the algorithm. Do you understand what I'm saying? And because what they understand is, if I can control the algorithm and show you sin all day and show you show you junk all day it gets it it, it 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 what it does it diminishes your spirit man but it builds up your flesh man and when you're up against uh, uh, the wall and gotta do battle your spirit it's not strong enough to conflict against it and so here's the question what is your algorithm between your flesh and your spirit Oh, great God today. Here's what the Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. He says, he says, this I say then, walk in the spirit. Walk in the spirit, here it is, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Mm. The reason why the lust of the flesh get the best of us is because we're walking in the flesh, but not in the spirit. Hallelujah. You barely got your eyes open. And you're looking at the gossip that's going on. Hallelujah. Typing in your comments. Hallelujah. I ain't talking to nobody in this room. I'm talking to people that's out there in the street. All right, just so y'all. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Because I, 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 I kind of felt I wouldn't get an amen there. But I wasn't prepared to hear amen right there. But my point is, my point is, he says, this I say, then, amen, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Watch this. He says, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Watch this. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They're contrary. That's why there's such a battle going on on the inside. There's a battle between the flesh man and the spirit man. Great God today. And in the 17th verse of our text, Paul talks about um, uh, the flesh lusting against the spirit. This is what he says. He says, remember uh, because the flesh, remember not because the flesh is not subject to the law of God, uh, it, it, it always wants to fulfill its carnal, sinful, and lustful desires without considering the consequences. Yes. Yes. Because there is no spiritual governor there. The spirit of man has not been built up in its utmost holy faith. You have spirit, but it's weak. Because the Bible talks about building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, spending time singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart because you got a battle every day. And the weaker your spirit man is, the stronger your flesh man becomes. Am I right about it? And it gets so strong until, it gets so strong until, until your flesh man Amen. And your desires and, and, and lusts, amen, become so strong that you do not even consider, amen, the consequences. I mean, I mean, think about it. Who, who would rob a bank if you knew you were going to get caught? Who, who would commit adultery if you knew you were going to get caught? You see, the carnality of your lust becomes a numbing agent. It numbs you, amen, to the reality of the consequences. Yes, Lord. I said it numbs you to the reality of your consequences because at the end of the day, the flesh does not pay the penalty. Your soul and spirit does. Did you hear what I just said? At the end of the day, 
your flesh man doesn't pay the penalty for all the partying and partying, you know, party, party time and, and all the backing it up and dropping it like it's hot and, 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 and indulging in sin and indulging in, in lustful things. The flesh doesn't pay for it. It is your spirit and your soul. Hallelujah. Therefore, your soul and spirit is responsible for the actions of your flesh. So here's the thing. Do not let your flesh condemn your soul and spirit to eternal separation from God. Hallelujah. In the 21st and the 22nd verse of our text, Paul says this. He says, he said, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is always present with me. And that's, that's, that's because everywhere you turn, there's opportunities to do evil. When you wake up in the morning, throughout your day, there's opportunities to do evil. I mean, you know, you, you, ain't, gotta, you ain't got to hunt for evil. Evil will find you. Amen. You don't have to. Brothers, if you look at a single woman more than three seconds, it'll find you. See, see, cause brothers, the difference between brothers and, 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 and ladies is different. See, see, brothers, brothers don't know how to do it. You see, brothers don't look two or three seconds. You know, just to say, oh, that's a nice person, you know, and you're going about your business. Brothers like. <laughs> you see. And, 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 and then they start this from top to bottom. <laughs> see, but ladies, y'all ain't no different. Y'all just, y'all just, you're professionals. See, cause a woman can do this. A woman can see a man and do this, can do this. And tell you what color shirt he got on, what color suit he got on, the brand of his shoes, and what the polka dot tie. And, and, and all you did was this. <laughs> it's in your nature. That's all right. God gave you that. He, he gave you that third eye. But my point, my point is, he said, I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is always present. Great God today. Hallelujah. What do I do? Every time I turn around, I have opportunities to do evil, to sin. Hmm. My flesh man desires it. And my spirit man is trying to warn me. How do I deal with it? How, 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 do, I, how do I win the battle? between my flesh and my spirit. Here's what Paul says in verse number 22. He says, for I delight in the law of God here after the inward man. That's it right there. That's it. He says, I delight in the law of God after. The word delight means to take pleasure in. And the word delight in itself means pleasure. Hallelujah. Amen. The options to do good or sin is everywhere. Amen. But he says, I delight in the law of God. After the inward man, I take delight in God. Hallelujah. I mean, I mean, you know, miss, you see what you see. You hear what you hear. But you respond to the delight in God. Did you hear what I said? Evil is always present. Amen. It's always present. It's not always what you see and what you hear. It's what you respond to. Did y'all hear what I just said? Amen, somebody. So then the caution is, be careful where you find delight. <laughs> be careful where you find that, like, that reminds me of this farmer who had a bull and six cows and he had them in defense. And you know the bull's job, he, listen, listen, he this, I ain't never seen a bull had it made like this bull because he was the only bull and had six cows. He could eat all the grass that he wanted to eat and his only responsibility was to satisfy them six cows. Good God Almighty. But one day he looked across the fence and from a distance he saw three cows. 
And he wasn't satisfied with the six that he had. You see, he wasn't satisfied with those. Because now his delight, mm, pleasure, was on the other side. He wanted something he never had. The Bible says, James says this, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Mm -hmm. You got to be careful what you lust for. It's camouflaged in death. And so day after day, day after day, hey man, he was enjoying the grass, but he got bored with the six cows. The fence was high. And so he was calculating how could he get over there to get to them three cows. And so finally one day, out of his desperation of the magnitude of his lust, uh, wanting to be pleased and satisfied, his delight got the best of him. And so he backs up and he takes off running. As big as he is and as heavy as he is, he know he can't make it over that big old fence. But lust when it is conceived, great come today, will cause you to do things that you can't do, that you believe you can do, only to find out you couldn't do it. But somehow the delight of his lust caused him to leap as high as he could. He made it over the fence, but he cut himself so bad that he would never be able to cross the fence again to the six cows. But at that moment, he was so consumed by his lust, it didn't matter. So he got up and he started moving, running toward the, the three cows. And when he finally got to them, he noticed they were bulls just like him. Are y'all hearing me here? Be careful where you find your delight. I got to close. I got to close. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 24, he says this. He says, he, he says by faith, Moses, amen, when he uh, came to years, refused to be called, amen, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Watch it. Choosing rather, mm, this is it, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. In other words, Moses was raised up in the Pharaoh's house. We know this. Amen. And, and he was taught their doctrine. But the Bible says that, that Moses, he did, not want, he did not want to be identified uh, as an Egyptian, but a Hebrew. Because of their root and their, their, their roots in God. Amen. And so he was, he was choosing, rather, to suffer affliction. Rather Amen. To enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And may I remind somebody as I close. Sin is for a season. I'm a writer about it. I said sin is for a season. Hallelujah. Because sin always has an expiration date. James says when sin is finished, it brings forth death. It doesn't tell you when it's finished. It just tells you what's going to happen when it's finished. But I'll tell you when it's finished. Sin will not be finished until it, until it humiliates you in the face of God. Until it robs you of your husband, your wife. Until it robs you of all of your relationships. Until it robs you of your job. Until it robs you of your well-being. Then comes death. Hallelujah to God. But as I close the 24th verse of our text, Paul says this. Oh, wretched man that I am. He says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In other words, he, he identified the, 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 the intense fight and battle that he was in. I'm talking about the apostle Paul who wrote the Pauline epistles, the New Testament. And yet he recognized that I'm having a battle Great cup today between my flesh and between my spirit. The things I want to do are not the things I end up doing. The things I shouldn't do end up being the things that I end up doing. And so he says, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me 
from the body of this death. Now, uh, as a student of the Bible, if you would go back and exegete that particular text, it gives it more theological meaning. Because when Paul says, O wretched man that I am who shall deliver me from the body of this death, he was actually referring to an Old Testament custom that there were times when you would murder somebody and the penalty, the penalty for murdering somebody is they would take that dead corpse hmm, and tie it to your back, arm and arm and leg to leg. And you had to walk around with that dead corpse on your back until it rotted off. And when Paul looked at the condition of his flesh hmm, between his spirit man he felt like I was walking around with a dead corpse on my body. And, and so he said, oh, wretched man, that I who shall deliver me from the body of this death. And that's when he went on to say, he said, yeah, 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 yeah. He says, he says, he says, yeah. He said, with my flesh, I serve sin. But with my mind, I serve the law of God. And you got to make up in your mind that I will not be defeated in my flesh. But my spirit, man. Is going to win. And when the Lord gave me this word, I could see in the spirit somebody in the room. You've been in a battle between your flesh and your spirit. You have the desire to love God and, and to live for God. But it seems like the flesh just keep pulling at you and tugging at you. Uh, you desire to win. But you're wondering sometimes, how is it I take one step forward and, and three steps backwards? How, 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 how do I ever win this battle? Well, I got the answer for you. And the best way for me to describe it for you is, is to paint this picture of you in a boxing ring. In one corner, you have your human nature. In the other corner, you have your spirit nature. And the Holy Ghost is the referee in the middle of the ring. And I can hear him say, in this corner is the flesh man of Norman Hutchins. And in this corner is the spirit man of Norman Hutchins and they get ready to ring the bell and the Holy Ghost says I want you to come out fighting and when they rang the bell we came out fighting and we begin to fight in the first round only to discover that the, the flesh won the first round then the flesh won the second round the flesh won the third round but when I went back in the corner and asked my coach how is it possible that I'm losing every round he says well let me tell you why you're losing it's because, you're, it's because, it's because your spirit man was busy looking at television your spirit man was busy in gossip your spirit man was not reading the Bible, was not praying, was not fasting. And so your flesh man, he was fueled by his sin. He was fueled by trouble and triumph. And when he came out fighting, your flesh fought your spirit because your spirit is weak. And all of a sudden, the fight was forfeited. My, my spirit man didn't want to get back in the ring. But they set up another fight a month later. And for that whole month, my spirit man began to read the Bible. Begin to pray in the morning. Begin to fast through the day. Listening to the word of God building up my faith praying in the Holy Ghost and when the next fight came when I came out because my spirit man was sound in the word sound in faith 
I knocked out the flesh man. They declared me the winner. See, I'm trying to tell somebody you can win this fight. Clap your hands. Come on, jump to your feet. Come on. Go to two people and tell them you can win. Tell them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The battle between two natures. Your flesh nature and your spirit nature. Always remember this. The only reason why God gave you flesh is so that you can touch the physical. And the truth of the matter is this. That when God formed man out of the dust of the ground, gave him eyes and ears and fingers and put a heart in him and then gave him the breath of God, spirit and soul, great God today. He was in that moment that the two, the body, soul, and spirit, the three, the body, soul, and spirit, the three, they were one. The body wasn't contaminated because he had just made man. It was only after the sin of Adam that there became a division between his flesh, soul, and spirit and that's where the fight began but in the process of time Jesus would come to the earth and down the cross to redeem us back to himself that not only we would become one with God but we would become one again with our human nature the only difference now as opposed to before the fall of man. The spirit and soul didn't have to keep the body in subjection because they were one. But sin separated the human nature from the spirit nature. And now you just have to make sure, as Paul says, I keep my body under. I mortify the deeds of my body. I consciously tell my flesh nature, no, 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 not today. I don't care what you're thinking. No, no. No, 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 no. You will obey my spirit, man. You will control your appetite because your human flesh and you're seeing it happen in the kingdom right now can rob you of all that God has done through you because you yield to your flesh and did not keep it under subjection. There are some things you can bounce back from but there are other things that can be detrimental to how God can use you in the kingdom. Am I right about it? And so the truth is, I really don't have time 
to worry about you and your spirit and your flesh. I got enough to keep Norman in check. Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I just said? But what I come to understand is that God is able to keep that which we commit unto him. Hallelujah. And I don't look at another man's failure and glorify myself. But what I say is, God, if not but for your grace, there go I. It just only reminds me ever more reason why I got to keep my spirit of man strong and built up in the faith. Hallelujah. Because you never know how the enemy is going to come after you. Who do you think in this room is under the heaviest attack? <laughs> I tell you, it would be the one that stands before you preaching the gospel. Yes. Because the enemy and his strategy is that if I can contaminate the mouth that speaks, it affects the ears that's listening. And the Lord said to me a long time ago, he says, Norman, I want you to protect the integrity of my voice. And I'm driving down the road crying, saying, God, how do I do that? How do I protect the integrity of your voice? And you know, sometimes you say, yes, Lord, yeah. You saying yes, Lord, without knowing what would that mean. And the Lord said to me, protect the integrity of my voice, of his voice, of his voice. And he said, this is how you do it. He says, when you protect the integrity of your voice, you protect the integrity of my voice. Because nobody wants to hear my voice through your voice if there's no integrity to your voice. And don't you think for one moment that the enemy didn't hear that too. And so he comes after you. But the reason why you don't have to be afraid, you don't have to be nervous, is because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Am I right about it? I'm going to pray today for anybody in this room. You heard this message. The first order of business is to be honest with yourselves. I didn't, God didn't, God did not relocate my wife and I to Los, Los Angeles to play games with the devil. He didn't, he didn't bring us 3,000 miles away for me to sugarcoat the gospel. And for me to, to, you know, you know, it's like, you know, you, you little kid, you riding down the road. Your mama told you not to get on the bike. You see, you ride down the road, she told you, put the bike up. And you're going to sneak the bike, you ride down the road, and you fall over and scar your arm. Now you're going to run her mom. I scar my arm. She's like, come here, come here. And she, she said, well, how'd you do it? <laughs> see, see, now you're trying to make up a lie. You ain't trying to tell. You, you, you ain't going to tell. I was riding down the, down the street and, and uh, you know, and on my bike. And then you know what's coming next, right? Didn't I tell you not to get on the bike? You see, I'll tell you something funny that I'm going to pray. I'll never forget one time when we used to love to go to the store. Our mom, me, my little, me and two of my sisters, and, uh, and we would be in the car. And my mom would say, y'all stay in this car. Don't you get out this car. And she'd go in the store. And my little sister, she had some now later. Y'all remember now later? She had, and especially the, the, the banana kind. Oh, Jesus. Lord have her. She is a banana now later. It's my favorite. And you know what she said to me? She said, Norman, 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 I give you a pack of nallies if you get out and run around the car one time. <laughs> y'all, y'all, y'all already know how that ended up, right? So I get the now later. No, you know, she was give it to me after, after I did it. So I jumped out of the car, I ran around the car and got ready to go back in the car. They locked the doors. <laughs> now you know what I already know, right? That mama's coming up out of that store. 
And so, sure, sure enough, they went over there. They in just laughing. Oh, I mean, she got the nine ladies all against the window. You know, just, 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 you know, you know, you know why? Cause my lust got the best of me, and I didn't think about the consequences, did I? And sure enough, here come my mama rolling that cart out there with her, with, with her, with her uh, uh, pocketbook across her shoulder. You know, you know, I'm telling my mama was a modern day Medea. I promise you that. She whoop anybody's children. She said, come here, little boy. Come here, little boy. Come. She, she, she be in the grocery store. Look here acting up, uh, you know, whatever. She run over there to him. Boy, you better get up and, 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 and act right. I mean, one time we was in the store. Somebody else was getting, getting, you know, acting up, acting up. She looked at me and said, I wish you would. I'm like, I didn't do nothing. And so here she come rolling her cart. And you know, I start crying. Oh, mama, oh, they love me out the car. Who told you to get out the car? Why are you out the car? And you know why I got a whooping? Right outside the car. You see. And so sometimes, and so sometimes we get in these situations. Hallelujah. Where the flesh gets the best of us because our spirit man is not strong enough. And there may be somebody in this room right now. I don't care who you are. Listen, listen, listen. If you've been battling your flesh, great God today, it's because your spirit man needs to be strengthened. That's why I'm here to preach to you. That's why I look forward to being here every Sunday to push you, to encourage you, to live this thing. Hallelujah to God. But if you've been battling with your flesh, and we ain't here to embarrass nobody, let me tell you something. Coming to the altar is a genuine statement to the devil and to yourself that you mean business. The Lord told me one time, he says, Norma, you want, you want deliverance, but you want private deliverance. He says, what you did wasn't privately. It wasn't private what you did. And so he said, there will be no private deliverance. Great God today. He says, you got to come. If in this room and you want God to strengthen your, your spirit man to battle your flesh. You know, 2014 is, 24, uh, uh, 20, 24 is coming. And you, if you think that the enemy fought you in this year, you wait to see what's coming. And you need to build up your holy faith. You need to build up your spirit man right now. Matter of fact, those of you who want God to build up your spirit man, get down here right now. Amen. And I'm not just talking about what your flesh did. I'm talking about what you want God to do in your spirit man. Come on, get to the altar right now. If you want God to build up you spiritually, hallelujah, so that you can face the wiles of the devil, so you can face what the enemy is planning and plotting against your life. Amen. For the year to come. Come on, come on. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, I know some of you say, well, look, Lord child, every time I turn around, I'm, I'm at that altar. Am I already? Yeah, 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 don't worry about that. No, don't you worry about it. Look, look, Lord Jesus, he, I was at the altar last week, week before that, week before that. I want to come, but Jesus, I'm the Lord. I'm, let me tell you something. Some of you, some of us, we need to just, we just need to, to build, to put a pillar at the altar and put our name on it. And every chance we get. Great God today. Come on, lift your hands right where you are. Lift your hands right where you are. Father, I thank you for this word that you have spoken in this house on today. I thank you for the people of God and for those that have come to this altar. I give you glory, I give you honor, and I give you praise. And Father, we don't know what 2024 holds for us, but what we do know is that Satan, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. But you told us to resist the devil. Resist the devil and he'll flee from us. And so, God, I'm praying that you will strengthen our spirit, man. I'm praying that you build us up where we're weak. I'm praying that you give us a discerning spirit. I'm praying that you help us. Come on, open your mouths and praise him right there. Praise him right there. Come on. Help me. Come on. Praise him right there. Let him strengthen you. I bind the devil. I cast him out. In the name of Jesus. Yes, God. Be strengthened. In Jesus' name. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. Never. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. Be healed. Be delivered. Be set free. Yes. Come on. 
Confesse Come on, give him praise. Come on, bless him. The anointing of God. Fall on you now. The anointing of God. Be on you now. Discerning spirit. Discerning act. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for ordering ourselves. Thank you, God, for rebuking the devil. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory. We give you honor. Come on and praise him. Praise him. Lift your hands right now. Anointing fall on me. Anointing fall on me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall on me. Anointing fall on me come on say it it's gonna happen anointing oh God fall on me anointing thank you fall on me yes God let the power of the Holy Ghost yeah, fall on me. Yes, anointing fall on me. With your hands lifted one more time, I anoint you in the name of Jesus that as you leave this altar, that God will go with you and that God is going to increase your spiritual discernment so that you will see the traps the plots and the plans of the enemy that as God ushers you into the new year amen you're not going to struggle in the areas that you've struggled before because there's too much work for you to do to have to keep casting out and rebuking them same devils God's going to give you victory in your life once and for all so that you can help pull other people out if you believe it, clap your hands and give God praise. You can return to your seat. Hallelujah. Come on. Yeah. Anointing. Oh, fall on me. Oh, anointing. Listen, if you're here today and you've been visiting for a few months or a few weeks or whatever.
said, I will encourage myself in the Lord. Come on, Zion, sing this with me. 